welcome to SDA Mastery, the podcast series hosted by Tanya Gomez Consulting. In each episode, we'll be sharing valuable insights and tips that can help you learn the intricacies of specialist disability accommodation. We will demystify the entire SDA process, give you direct access to experts in the field, and help you to discover what life is like as an SDA provider. Whether you're thinking about leaping into SDA or you're looking to level up your existing NDIS business, you're in the right place. Come on in, let's explore the SDA space together. Uh, Welcome to the couch. David. Thank you. Um, we're talking to David Whitelaw from ADAPT. And, uh, today we're talking about the process to build an SDA property. Um, and I guess my, my first question is, um, what is the process around building a property? Where do you begin? Where do you start? And what is your responsibility out of all of the different stakeholders that exist, yeah, it's it's a it's it's a hard one, and, and we we believe at Adapt Housing that the the key element is is location. It really has to be close to amenities, have good transport, shopping centres, hospitals, um, uh, paths. Um, we, when we we think about properties that are a little bit isolated, and participants are paying a dollar sixty, dollar eighty a k for transport, um, it starts to become very expensive. So having that opportunity to to find SDA properties that are either infill sites or within really good locations is a key factor. So location is probably the most most important element uh, when it comes to developing SDA. Um, I guess the other elements too is about the circulation space and the configuration. We, we've got to be really aware what a cell provider or care provider needs and, and we need to factor in not just the location but the configuration configuration, which means how many people would like to live together, whether participants want to live by themselves or, um, or, or whether uh, uh, you know, someone would like shared services. And so we really need to think about what the care provision uh, around it is. If it's really isolated, it's very hard to get workers. Infield sites in highly populated areas, it becomes easier to develop a roster of care. And, um, and being able to find um, employees that will come and support us as, as social workers. Um, so there are a couple of the key elements. Um, in developing an SDA, a, a key person around that SDA, apart from the investor and the developer, is an SDA access consultant. Um, we can't register a dwelling under the ADAPT housing uh, model without uh, a certificate from the SDA access consultant to say that it is accessible, it has all the circulation space, it has all um, the, the elements of a, whether it be high physical support or robust or improved ability, it has all those elements. So we need that special piece of paper and so they are absolutely vital in getting a property registered under the SDA. Mm, okay, wonderful. So when you're building an SDA property, what codes or standards are being used or being met? Yeah, so, so again, we come back to the SDA access consultant. That There's a few different guidelines. And if we look at the old system where we started, and adapt housing started about six or seven years ago, um, we, we looked at the, the silver, gold, and platinum levels uh, of, of the, uh, the building codes. And now we do focus a little bit on, on those. However, the design standards for SDA are, are much more strict and specific for for what we know participants require. Um, and so if we're looking at high physical support, we still need to think about um, uh, the, the Australian standards, but we also need to think about what the SDA standards are as well. And, uh, and whether it be an, an architect or a builder or a draftsman, um, working closely with an SDA access consultant to make sure that we get that model right. So, um, so there is a set of standards at the moment that exist that changes all the time. Um, and we know that over the last few years, we've had some very, very specific changes to the, to the SDA design standards. Um, and so they talk about the class of buildings, they talk about fire sprinklers. Um, I don't think the circulation space will change, but there's a few elements that are going to become a little bit more strict uh, about developing SDA. Right. And, and on average, how long does it take to build an SDA property? Um, yeah, it's um, 
We, we also sort of work with some modular guys as well. And uh, modular guys say that they can build a house between three and six months. But generally, um, from start to finish, depending on whether the land's titled or not, uh, right across the board, we're seeing between six and 12 months to build SDA. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of elements of, involved. Um, the Building an SDA uh, home has all the complexities of a 10 apartment complex because all the people involved, it is very, very complex. Mm. So what, what people are involved? So apart from the SDA access consultant, um, then you've got, you've got draftsmen, you've got builds, um, and then we've got the enrolment team because we pre-register dwellings. Um, then you've got the SDA provider as well, and we start exploring and supporting participants, either getting the right level of funding, we've got SIL providers, support coordinators, and then we've also got the, the occupational therapists that um, like to customise dwellings to specific needs. So once we've got a development and we, we, have, uh, we find someone that would like to move into it, there becomes that opportunity um, with, the, with the occupational therapists and the NDIS to be able to customise it um, to suit those specific needs. And, and you spoke a moment ago about location being really important. Um, and obviously, you know, when I'm buying a house, location is number one. You want to be close to the school catchment or, you know, whatever it is that's mm. important to you at that time in your life. I, I wonder how does it work with SDA being that it, that it has to be or mostly has to be a new build? Where are you finding blocks of land that are empty to build SDA mm. premises on that are yeah. in locations. Adapt Housing is, is the SDA provider. And, uh, and at the moment, we value those organisations who have the ability to find the right sites to put the developments together. We also work closely with developers who have been sitting on land for quite a long time in great locations. Um, and they've got the ability to put villa developments and apartment complexes together. And so we work closely with those guys. Um, it, it is hard finding the right location. We're seeing at the moment, though, some splitter blocks where infill sites, where maybe that old houses can be knocked down, split, and we can get two houses on it. But there are also some new estates that are coming through as well, and nice estates, but it's still going to be close to amenities. Um, I remember seeing a development just recently that hit my table and it's a new estate but what they've done is that there's a, a Woolworths very close by so obviously Woolworths have done their, done their sums and a lot of data collection and they know that it's a very growth area and, uh, and so that's why we're excited about seeing some SDA developments in newer estates providing it's close to those amenities. Yeah, yeah. And if, a, if someone is, is going to choose a builder um, for SDA, is it are they just choosing the local builder down the road, or are they specialist builders that that understand things like design categories and work yeah. with the access consultants? There, there are builders out there that have a lot of knowledge, um, but where where we're seeing a lot more success is where a company creates a team around a, around a development, and and that includes the builder, the architect, and the SDA provider, as well as the OT, and then the access consultant again is a, I reflect a lot on the access consultant because without their documentation so it's really a team approach I speak to builders all the time about wanting to be able to do a build in a great location they've got knowledge of the old system and old structures of gold uh, sorry silver gold and platinum um, but what they have to incorporate are the, the SDA design standards. And so we, we wrap a team around those developments to help uh, making sure that they will get registered at the end of the day. Mm. So you don't have to be a specialist builder, but you've got to have a team that has a lot of knowledge about it. Right. And you mentioned the enrolment of dwellings process. Yep. Can you explain what that is and how that works and how yep. that plays a part in the process? Yeah, we've been working with the enrolment team for quite a number of years and, and uh, within the NDIA. And, uh, and, and what we're able to do is send them the pre-enrolment. So an SDA access consultant will have a look at the plans, look at the location um, and, uh, and pre-register the dwelling. So all the information about that dwelling goes off to the NDIA um, and they, they hold it, they look at it, they give some feedback um, and, uh, and they, uh, I guess, give us their assumptions of what it will be registered 
registered at because we've got uh, all different architects like to provide different things and there's a bit of discrepancy between apartments and villas and group homes and houses um, and so we need to get their input and they need to tell us what their assumptions are. We also have to provide a density ratio to make sure that we don't have any more than say 15 participants that are living on any one site. Um, so we've got to provide that information. Again, it's the team that wraps around those. The, the, the dwellings actually get pre-enrolled. We get feedback on those. And if the builder can build to that, then we won't have any issues at the end of the day at registering the dwellings. Mm, okay, wonderful. Um, in your opinion, what does it take to be a good SDA provider? If someone's looking to choose an SDA provider, whether they're a participant or a, a SIL provider or you know, even an investor is looking at different providers that are mm. involved, what's the, the measure or the metrics of, of, a, of a good SDA provider? Yeah, we are all very different. Um, our model is, is, as I said, we don't do project management and we value organisations like NDIS Property Australia, for example. We value the developer that has the land and we just we just do the, the, the SDA governance work around, around SDA. However, other organisations do their own project management or they've got a fund that backs them as well. With our process, um, because we're just the SDA provider, we don't do SIL, we don't do ILO, we don't do care provision at all, we just do the, the SDA and we do it well. Um, we're just focused on one key component of that. We have a great relationship with the NDIS um, and we've got our systems and our processes and our structures um, that are assessed every year. We're audited every year. Um, and uh, and the last um, work that we did with our auditor, we had zero non-compliances, which is fantastic. So we had no issues with our processes. So we understand what SDA is and, uh, and it's about working alongside the NDIA, um, about supporting participants. And sometimes it's about helping them get SDA into their plans as well. So from our perspective, we really value just being the SDA and doing one thing and doing it well. Yeah, right. And there are providers that do the SDA and the SIL also yep. as the same provider. And obviously there's a little bit of a conflict of interest there that you need to minimise. But what do you think from the SIL providers you work with makes a good SIL provider? Yep, yeah. Some, some SIL providers and care providers use new dwellings to support participants who are in stock that's not suitable, so in housing that's old, it might be 1960s, 1970s, fax and attic housing, old, old block funding housing. And so they would support participants moving into new dwellings and creating forever homes. Sometimes a cell provider might look at a, a development to um, to, to have growth in a certain area um, and, and a lot of their growth strategies are based around property. Um, a lot of participants in particular in the NDIA uh, uh, or in the NDIS are looking for forever homes mm -hmm. and, uh, and we can create those forever homes uh, if they're in good locations and we've got that good relationship with a, uh, with a SIL provider and, and an SDA provider as well. Um, so I, I guess for us, it's the collaboration. As I said, we manage the bricks and mortar and they manage the care. There is a conflict um, and a lot of um, still providers are still SDA providers and it was they softened on that in, in 2016 and 2017 when a lot of existing stock was rolled over. Um, now they're starting to really push for that separation um, and it's important when it comes to choice and control for a participant. Yeah, absolutely. When you're building an SDA home, how do you said that location was important? How do you choose the right location and the right design standard so that you can minimise the risk of not being able to find a participant for your property? Yeah, we've we've created a, a formula. As I said, we're not builders; we're just the, the SDA guys, and we value what people are bringing to us. Um, and if someone comes to us with, with money, it's it's not our process to work with them. If someone comes to us with a site and a specific design, then we're able to give them feedback on what we feel is really valuable. And we've worked with many participants, occupational therapists, SIL providers, um, support coordinators, to create a formula that we think is really valuable for everyone, in particular the participant. And that's why location is important. You've got to be close to amenities. You've got to make sure the configuration 
remuneration is right is that you know whether whether group homes you know are, are right or whether individual villas or apartments are right it's really up to the participant mm. Mm -hmm. wonderful I think that's all the questions that I have for you today about the process of SDA houses. Thank you so much for joining me. It's all right. Thanks for the opportunity. Was there anything you think that I've missed or you'd like to add about? Yeah. The SD, there, there are quite a few SDA providers, of course, uh, in, in, uh, in Australia. And, uh, and we, we work from Cairns down to Melbourne and, and as we're at the Northern Territory as well, which is exciting to, to be travelling and working all over, all over Australia to support participants. Um, our, our process is just, we're just the SDA provider. Um, and, uh, and as I said, we just do one thing and we do it well. We really value what the, what the, the investor and the, and the developer are able to bring to us when it comes to SDA properties. And we're seeing some wonderful projects and we're seeing some wonderful sites and, uh, and we've seen some wonderful stories of participants finding their forever homes. One last question that I have for you is that if you have someone who is um, considering being an SDA provider, what advice would you give them about determining if this is right for them? Wanting to be an SDA provider, mm. that would be the opposition for us. Yeah. Um, right. It is complex. It is very, very complex. And you've got to have knowledge of not just SDA, you've got to have a, a knowledge of MTA, STA, ILO, SIL. You've got to have so much knowledge around that. And you've got to have that relationship with the NDIS. Mm. Because at times, participants will just drop off our portal and we don't know why. They're still living in our Developments, and because SDA is is wrapped up with a whole lot of other line items, um, it's about going back to the NDIS and saying, "Hey, this person's dropped off our portal. Why?" And sometimes the NDIS just forgets to press a button and roll over plans, and it's very very complex. Having that relationship, key workers in the NDIA that we work closely with, um, and just to try and reduce those risks as much as we can. What would you say is the biggest challenge for SDA providers? Um, the NDIA. In particular, it's it's still even though they've been operating under SDA for six or seven years, it's still evolving, mm -hmm. um, and um, and evidence and and material and data that we provide, they use that data to, to continue making those productive changes, um, and we're seeing it evolve, and it does improve. It's challenging, but it is improving all the time. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the couch today. Welcome. And I look forward to continuing our conversation. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of SDA Mastery by Tanya Gomez Consulting. We hope you found this episode helpful and valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave us a rating and share it with others. Until next time, keep learning.